Hi, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Amy Orlov. I'm Vice President of Programs at Forte, and I'm really excited about today's webinar. Now, some of you are registered for today's webinar through our Woe Plus Men Lead webinar series, which is basically our male ally webinar series. Others of you came to this session today via our um, Don't Quarantine Your Career series, which is our newest offering over a six-week period um, to help all of us kind of adjust to this new online normal that we're all living. Um, we like to think of this as a crossover. And um, if you don't know what a crossover is, think about TV shows. When they take your favorite characters from two different shows, and they merge them into kind of one special episode, you know, they unite over a common plot line, like in um, when they did the scandal, how to get away with murder crossover, or um, for, for, for so many more of us, this is probably a more identifiable reference, the Simpsons and Family Guy crossover. Well, that's what today's is. Today is a crossover webinar. Um, when we first started planning for this webinar back in October, I think, uh, what our goal was, was to talk to companies that had instituted Men of Allies programs within their companies using our Forte curriculum. And we're still going to be doing that, but let's face it, the world is a little bit different than when we started planning um, in October. And right now, almost all of us are working online. Um, this is probably about the 100th Zoom session that many of you have been on this week or maybe even today. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, um, about creating and, and sustaining a men as allies culture within your organization through this virtual environment. What we're, how we're going to start is I'm going to walk you through our curriculum to use as a starting point, and then we're going to turn it over to our two guests uh, who can share with us a little bit about how they're adapting Men as Allies um, programmatically into virtual culture. So let's start from the very beginning. Uh, the goal of any male ally program is really to provide anyone, all genders, with tools so that they could be active participants towards the goal of reaching gender equality at work. Companies across our Forte network have been instituting Men as Allies programs. And today we're joined by PNC's Josh Stewart and Amazon's Kirsten Mitchell. Um, I'm gonna ask Josh and Kirsten to take a few minutes and introduce yourself. We'll start with, with you, Josh. You could give your, your name, your title, and maybe kind of um, I gave what I thought was an overarching goal for a Men as Allies program, but what drove PNC to adopt a Men as Allies program? Awesome. Good afternoon. Are we afternoon? Yes, we're good afternoon uh, here from the East Coast, at least. It's great to be here, and thanks, Amy, for the invitation. We are absolutely uh, all learning uh, the ins and outs of Zoom and all the other platforms. And so I uh, appreciate uh, convening even in a virtual way this afternoon to talk about virtual things. Uh, I'm Josh Stewart. I'm the Vice President and Director of Talent Programs and Accessibility for PNC. Uh, that includes a number of things, but in general, all of our early career hiring initiatives and development initiatives, in addition to our work around building an inclusive culture for employees and customers with disabilities. Uh, we've been uh, a longtime partner with Forte, excited about that relationship and the collaboration to really build this Men as Allies experience and begin to implement it. We've got lots of um, experience uh, to share and uh, happy to be here today. One way to sum it up, um, we think about Men as Allies in lots of different ways, but I think if I had to try to boil it down to something that was um, resonant with our culture is it really helps us to advance what we refer to as our talent focused culture, right? Really getting the right people and the right roles doing their best work as a company. Uh, and that being a diverse and inclusive culture that fosters that. So this is a continued maturity and advancement of all that we do in diversity and inclusion and in talent. Thank you so much. Kirsten, can I hand it over to you? 
Yeah, I love that. I'm Kirsten Mitchell. I'm uh, an inclusion and diversity leader within Amazon. I previously, for about three years, was supporting our worldwide customer service organization, which is where we started um, with this program, and currently I'm supporting um, the AWS cryptography and security engineering team. Um, but long story short, um, the reason why we um, started engaging with Forte here was because we have a really strong culture um, of women's leadership. Um, we've had a women's leadership program that's been in place since early 2015 within worldwide customer service that's expanded um, across Amazon in a number of different areas. Um, but the consistent conversation coming out of that from the women and their managers um, and our leaders was, and what's next? Um, and this really was a perfect opportunity to continue to bring those women together with their male peers, um, because this is not a, a we fix this for ourselves. Um, <laughs> this is a conversation together regardless of gender. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to share uh, perspectives, experiences, um, and collaborate together to create a more equitable um, and inclusive environment for everyone in the workplace. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, I just want to, before, before I dive in, I want to share with you all, yes, this is being recorded and we will be sharing this recording. Um, we had a few questions come in on that topic. So Kirsten, Josh, so happy you can um, join us on today's webinar. Really excited. Now, if you're new to Men as Allies, you need to know that Forte has a host of resources available on our site. You just need to go to fortefoundation.org there's a Programs tab, and under the Programs tab, you'll see Men as Allies. Just click on that, and it will take you to this microsite, which you see on the screen. There you're going to find articles and examples and resources for male ally programs, including our MBA and corporate toolkit. But you're also going to find our comprehensive curriculum, or at least information about our comprehensive curriculum. You're also going to find on that site links to past webinars we've done on this topic. And for those of you that are brand new, I suggest going to the October 2019 webinar where we really introduce you to not just the idea of men as allies, not just how you can get involved, but um, we go into a little bit more depth on our resources. We, um, we started in the space of offering a corporate toolkit. And the first question we got was, this is great, but we need more about how to. Um, so can you give us step-by-step -step instructions on how to create a, a male ally program? And that's what we did. Our comprehensive curriculum um, consists of an overall user guide. Each individual module has facilitator guides, PowerPoints, scripts, worksheets, all the materials that you could possibly need to implement a male ally culture within your organization. Um, now, we have divided up male allyship into three components. There's reflection. Reflection is really um, the time period in which men are first introduced to the concept of male allyship. But it's also a time where they start to think about their own relationship with gender and develop their, a gender lens. Then there's education, in which we introduce them to a lot of the research that's been done in the gender equity space, as well as important topics like intersectionality and mentoring. And finally, after those two pieces, you can move to action. Right, so not only um, introdu introducing our ally framework, but also some obstacles that you might encounter along the way, such as, as barriers and, and bias, before men can dive in and start to create their own personal action plans, and you as an organization can start to create an overarching action plan. As you can see within each of these three components, there's three individual modules. Unfortunate, oh, here's, here's a slide, sorry. I was jumping ahead to the other slide, but this just gives you an idea. This is from our user guide. This is a page in our user guide, and it shows you that each individual mod module has learning objectives, objectives and activities, as well as, if you can read it, it's small on the bottom of the screen, but all of the materials that we provide that are needed within each module. This is where I started to say, unfortunately. Unfortunately, uh, when we revised everything in January 2020, we did not have a crystal ball. Had we had a crystal ball, we would have designed everything to be virtual. 
Instead, what we did is we talked about which components of our program lend themselves to a virtual delivery and which are probably better delivered in person. Also within our user guide and through the curriculum, we talked about how you can take nine individual modules and reduce them into, into a shorter time span and a shorter number of modules. Why? Because we know time is a really precious commodity for all of you. So having said that, that should give you at least the framework to think about our male allies curriculum and what we have to offer. I'm gonna turn it over to Josh um, to talk us a little bit through the PNC before we start going back and forth with questions with the audience. Awesome, thanks, Amy. Boy, I wish we did have that crystal ball and lots for lots of reasons, uh, virtual training and everything else. But um, I think the good news here and why we're here to talk today is that ally work can be virtual work um, and allies really are everywhere and can be everywhere and so the ways that we integrate allies into our um, thinking about training and learning and uh, just into our business of inclusion um, is not so difficult uh, because so many of us are already used to virtual environments and just really adding the ally lens to that but more on that in just a minute Let's talk first, just as a bit of a key study, you know, um, PNC's journey uh, on the Ally program. And this is pretty high level, um, but just to give you a sense of um, where we came from into this conversation. So as I was thinking about this and thinking about where we are today, um, timing is everything. Uh, and that uh, certainly applies to how we're thinking about applying virtual models to lots of our business, but um, also thinking about our readiness for a program like this, be it virtual or in person or in any other format for that matter. And so our work on gender inclusion uh, continues to mature. Uh, and we've been doing work in uh, diversity and inclusion, which includes gender uh, for an awfully long time. Uh, it's you know more than a value on our wall. It is a value, a core value for us, diversity and inclusion, but the ways in which that comes to life are um, diverse. On the slide, you see a couple examples. It's not meant to be uh, exhaustive, and I won't look at every single one of them um, here this afternoon. But uh, this, the, the ability to uh, really launch an allies program is built on the foundation of lots of other work that came before, and our own readiness to you know move into that next uh, piece of our journey. One of the oldest things, um, uh, most tenured conversations in the organization was this idea of women's business advocates. We have a uh, women's business advocate certification that looks at what's the application of gender um, in sales roles and how do our um, frontline employees and really at this point it's open to all employees think about um, the intersection of their day-to-day -day work and gender. And so we have uh, many, many women's business advocates who are certified around the company and that work uh, started um, as early as 2000. Women Connect is our employee business resource group or employee network uh, focused on gender. And uh, they too have been around for quite some time. It is, I believe, um, either the largest or almost the largest um, grouping of employee business resource groups. So we have many, many chapters of Women Connect all around our footprint. And each one of them taking up um, different um, uh, strategies, different work sets that respond not only to the topic of gender and women, but then also to uh, respond to their market and what their market needs because they're geographically dispersed. In the middle, you see some reference and, um, to technology and CIB, AMG, those are different business lines for us. Uh, we saw in 2017, some of our lines of business beginning to think about gender and breaking out a little bit, some subgroups of our Women Connect uh, uh, focus and thinking about the application specifically to their business. So certainly a whole nother webinar, we could talk about technology and gender, uh, but that group is focused on that. And corporate banking, thinking about how early career women really move through the, their organizations. We've had a women's leadership development program for a long time as well kind of guessing at that date actually, but uh, I know it's been uh, it's a, one of our oldest leadership development programs and one that continues to persist and be really successful in our firm. And again, so many more things that we can point to as good work around diversity and inclusion that's focused on gender. In 2016, um, the questions began to come about how do we more um, specifically or intentionally include men? And so uh, it, 
different levels or in different ways that began to be addressed a bit more organically. And so a senior group of men came together and, and were working through uh, that and thinking about gender equity for their ind individual lines of business. And then in 2017, probably most excitingly, we uh, began the conversation with Forte around building a men as allies program, which is what we're here to talk about today. Um, the Women Connect group, um, some of them, not all of the chapters, also were thinking about this all at the same time. So again, timing really is everything. They had, we had, as an organization, moved through lots and lots of steps, and now people ask new questions and we come to them with new solutions. Uh, the Male Ambassadors Program is a part of Women Connect. Some chapters have decided that they wanted to be more intentional based on where they were in the maturity of their programming to include men. So they began some of this work as well. So even now in our allies work, we're addressing it in many ways at very senior levels, at the manager level, and then at the EBRG, the Women Connect EBRG, using ambassadors to really welcome everybody into this conversation uh, around allyship and uh, men's inclusion and gen the gender conversation. So that's a bit of our history, our timeline of how we got there. On the next slide, uh, you'll see then how we evolve into the Men as Allies program um, in particular and what that looks like for us. As Amy shared, really there's these three areas, self-awareness and acumen building and application, those being so important to how we approach the program and good news, all three of those things can be done in a virtual way or in an in-person way. Um, and I sh I'm sharing with you now what that looked like for us as a pilot and what it's looking like for us now. In 2018, it was a bit of a test and learn, right? We had um, all nine workshops and three cohorts of 15 participants each. Um, maybe not surprisingly and maybe um, uh, uh, kind of counter to this conversation is the men wanted it to be in person. They got into that first session and they said, wow, this is so impactful. And they kind of opted into an in-person delivery. We gave them the option though of being virtual from the very beginning. Uh, and so, but they decided that this was great, uh, a great way to connect on the topic of gender. And so we moved them through the series of workshops over the course of a year. They were only 90 minute or two hour workshops at most. And so easily reformatted if we needed to go virtual, but um, we did mostly in person in that first year of the pilot. In 2020, so the year we're in now, sticking with three cohorts, but expanding the size of the cohorts a bit. Uh, so we have 30 people in each cohort and there's 90 participants uh, overall that will kind of move through over the course of a year. Uh, we've narrowed it down to really five workshops. Two are in person, so it's kind of the beginning and the end. And then all the activity in the middle uh, by design is virtual. Really responding to um, how learning and development occurs in a large organization, the capacity for people to travel into the same location all the time. I'm sure challenges that you're well aware of as business leaders. Virtual is part of business. And so we made that adaptation before all the things that we're doing now that are kind of uh, more forced virtual options. Um, and uh, it's working well. Uh, three months is the overall duration of the program. So that allows us to we condense the program a bit, but the content really is still remaining the same. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll talk about um, uh, the results uh, that we saw, just as a quick snapshot of this pilot. So we looked at lots of different measures in lots of different areas, and on a five-point scale, we saw significant increases in all of the questions that we asked, but calling out three uh, in particular. Um, in this focus of self-awareness, an increase of 0.67, which on a five-point scale, all of this is really statistically significant, is pretty significant. Um, I'm aware of how gender shapes my perspectives and behaviors. Some of these marks in the pre-survey came in pretty strong. Uh, and so we were a little skeptical, like, well, they really go up that much because people are really feeling pretty good about this going into the conversation. I think what we would have, uh, or what we did see was a realization midway through the program of, oh, I wasn't thinking about it quite that way, right? A little bit of a dip in self-awareness, a realization that I don't know what I don't know. And then as we move through the program, kind of moving back up that scale and ultimately seeing an increase in this idea of, um, thinking how your own perspectives and behave, uh, shape your behaviors. Acumen building is a big jump. And so a lot of the men came into the program asking questions around um, how do I know when there's an inequity happening? Or what are the things that I might do, which is more the application. So 
through um, looking at research and just active conversations, a pretty significant increase in 1.01 in men knowing what those inequities are and then being able to spot them. And then finally, um, application. We got really narrow and said, in the last 10 days, have you acted, acted intentionally to support gender equity? And uh, we saw an almost point increase there. A uh, little bit of discussion, right, of why is it 10 days? Is it 10 business days? Or, uh, but once we got through that, uh, the point of it is, how recent was the action and how intentional was, was the action? And did you remember it? Um, that's what we're trying to get to here um, because it's a, it's a muscle that we have to continue to build and practice over time. And that muscle can be built virtually and that muscle can be built in person as well. Uh, and so uh, we, we were happy with that result and anticipating similar results um, in this year's program. This is, this is from the pilot. So uh, what does this mean for us virtually? That's kind of setting the stage for us of you know, how PNC um, uh, ran the program. On the next slide, kind of just looked at this in three different groupings. And I'm gonna um, start with borrowing the expertise of my friend Kirsten from uh, Amazon. And maybe uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start with asking you a question or two. And so what we wanna do is think about, we live diversity and inclusion in a number of ways uh, across our individual organizations. And I'm imagining that's very different, but in some very the same. Uh, and you too are running a virtual version um, or a, sorry, a Men as Allies program. And so I'm curious, um, how have you deployed the Men as Allies program? And are you finding yourself making some adaptations to make it more virtual now? Yeah, well, what's interesting is we definitely realized, um, and Amy and I had lots of conversations about this, that trying to put together a cohort of men for nine sessions over a period of months was never going to work for us in our environment. Um, and so I actually initially pulled the material together um, with a combination of, of Forte's materials um, and our women's leadership program and built a two-day program. Um, so that was what we did first. Um, and we actually tested it one day in person and one day virtually with our, our leadership team in India um, with really strong positive results. I won't dive into those, but what I saw on your screen uh, very much kind of outlined a very similar trajectory from the standpoint of I thought I knew a lot, I realized what I didn't know, um, and then I intentionally used it um, after the sessions. Um, but what's interesting is, as the team I was supporting previously has a really large virtual pr footprint um, and had that large virtual footprint before um, our current situations. And so we decided to test uh, a different one with um, doing a five sessions rather than nine, because again, really kind of trying to weave that into the, the way the business works. Um, and did five 90-minute sessions um, of having these conversations. And we learned a lot. Um, what I found was um, initially we were testing with platforms that do small breakout groups, similar though to the way we would do in class, have a couple people talk together, pull back together as a large group. But when you think about 90 minutes, um, really hard to pull together both um, you know, your small group conversation and then get all those learnings into the larger space. Um, so after sessions one, we stopped doing small groups. Um, what I found is that it's really helpful to provide um, pre-reading and context, um, but also you have to think about the fact that people probably won't do it. Um, <laughs> so um, being willing to kind of cover what some of that looked like um, initially walking into it and then uh, build a space even virtually where people feel safe to talk about some of these things. Um, and we want to acknowledge that right up front in every single session, which isn't always necessary. When you start doing those personal ones, you might only have to touch on that one or two times. Awesome. But I think, yeah. I'll say that's that's a good start anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a huge start um, for sure. I think there's lots of different tools that we can use or repurpose um, specifically uh, in a virtual audience or for a virtual setting. And again, I go back to one of the early points. Um, we've been operating in a virtual world for a long time, especially if you're a global organization like Amazon and the way that you train um, may be very different uh, and needing to think more proactively about how things play out in a virtual setting is important. Um, let me just do a follow on, um, Kirsten. How do you, um, I think you're facilitating part of the programs, but any tips or tricks on how you draw out conversation in a virtual form format? So you lob a big question out there and crickets, right? And so then what do you do? 
Yeah, you know, I'm a real fan of having one or two people planted in your audience. Um, <laughs> I have been doing virtual facilitation for quite a while, um, and it's really helpful to have, you know, another one or two allies, male or female, um, in there that are going to help share experiences, conversation, things that are different than yours. Um, I heard it said on another training I was doing today, your experience is your experience and somebody else's is theirs. Um, and it can get really boring if the only person that's sharing their personal lived experiences is you as the facilitator. Um, and so I think it's super critical. Um, I tend to have one or two people where I have actually kind of pre-prepped them with, these are a couple of the things that we're going to talk about today. Could you think about some things? Are you willing to do that? Um, the way we've intentionally seeded our programs here is that we have women that have participated in our women's leadership program or facilitators of that program um, that are the women that are within these cohorts. Um, and we're actually looking at about a 60% men, 40% women gender split within our cohorts and we're doing that really intentionally because they're bringing their lived experience um, along with the folks that they've met along the way either through class or through the facilitation that they've done over the you know the many years that they've been doing it um, and that's super intentional so that we can bring in uh, a lot of different perspectives and not keep it quiet when it comes to that virtual nature of it um, I tend to say that I'm okay with uncomfortable silences <laughs> Um, and so I will allow time for people to think. Um, and then I will often ask, you know, do I need to rephrase the question? Because um, sometimes using different words um, makes it resonate differently. Or I can say, I'll share a personal example, and I'd love to have somebody else be willing to do the same. Um, occasionally, we get the chat box working a lot better um, than people willing to, to share those kind of personal experiences live. Um, and so I'll use that as a prompt. Um, as well. Love that. Um, you know, so much as you're sharing your comments and sitting here thinking, well, aren't these just, just best practices in general? Um, and sometimes these situations draw this out in us uh, and more inclusive practices. So this idea that you set an agenda and maybe set it a little ahead of time or give folks a bit of a preview of what we're talking about. So for men and men as allies programs, that might be particularly helpful because they may do a little more thinking about that. Can you drop a big question around allyship in the middle of a virtual room and they've not thought about allyship before? Well, hard for anyone to answer in person or virtual. But I know through the curriculum, there's some activities and pre-work things that help them kind of get there. And so we might think about in a virtual um, world, and you think about training and learning and um, some diversity inclusion conversations, how do you prepare people? Do you have a forum? Is there some tool that you use internally uh, where you can post some discussion questions ahead of the actual session? Uh, do you send a follow-up uh, with uh, some reading? And then, then the first next session uh, you say, so did you do the reading and what did you think? Everyone's learning and absorbing this information in so many different ways. So thinking about varying the modality and the ways that they get to the learning is just generally important, but especially important, I think, for folks participating uh, virtually. So I had broken up you know, the, the slide in kind of three areas. And I think um, for us, we we're thinking about um, diversity and inclusion and allyship, especially in lots of ways. These are three ways. Um, as was mentioned, I see some conversation in the chat, like how much of this is owned by the employee network and how much of this is owned by you know, HR? And where does this all live? Well, it's kind of all of it. So we think about um, how men uh, can be engaged. Some will you know, find training the best way and be attracted to kind of that form. Others may want to do it more virtually through employee network participation and others might be more interested in getting involved in mentorship and sponsorship, whether they're doing the mentoring and sponsorship or perhaps they're being mentored uh, as mentees uh, by a woman. So what does that look like is probably different for everybody and depending on your organization, who's responsible for that is very different. And what I like about the program is that it it really allows you to uh, tailor it to how that works for you. Um, down to the module or just down to thinking about the program holistically and you know um, putting the pieces together. For employee networks, you know, virtual programming can be more inclusive and can be less inclusive uh, depending on what it is. And so Virtual, um, virtual programming, uh, when you're using tools like WebEx or even just sending email communications, 
may provide some level of safety or comfort for people who wouldn't show up to the in-person session. Uh, and so is that kind of a step one to allyship? So you're curious about this and not that we're encouraging allies to hang out in the shadows and be mystery allies, that's not it. But how do you get into this conversation comfortably and maybe a virtual format allows you to listen first and then participate. And we talk about that journey in our ally program, right? There's a lot of learning and listening and thinking that has to occur before you just jump in and take action. So sometimes virtual um, settings can allow that to occur more naturally. Um, virtual Connections also offers, offers different opportunities to engage. I think about our organization and our business. Some folks uh, may not be able to step away uh, for in-person activities, but may have a small bits of time between things that they're doing to engage virtually. And so building things virtually will allow new folks to engage that just normally, just based on what they're doing, could not have. And so thinking virtually helps you to be more inclusive for the most part. It also can be less, right? If you build virtual things that are just really, really uh, exclusive um, or that you're not using those tools to be more engaging, right? You host a session and you don't look at the chat or uh, you're not responding to the need to have a discussion and it's just more lecture, uh, then that can be a little more exclusive. And so think about how you apply those things, but generally when it deployed well, it can be more inclusive. Kirsten was talking about that uh, a lot about the training pieces, tips and tricks. Um, lots of different platforms we are using or newly using. Again, we've got Zoom and WebEx and all kinds of things. Um, and different platforms offer different tools. Uh, I know one that is uh, particularly helpful, and uh, Kirsten, I'll reiterate because you mentioned this as well, uh, is this breakout room functionality. And so at the core of the program, uh, to, for me, is that this is not training. Uh, we don't come in and lecture people uh, for 90 minutes. Um, there's time and a place for that um, in trainings that are ha happening in your internal universities where we got to teach a particular skill or teach a particular application of business or a new system, a new process. That's important stuff. The real, co real core of this is really facilitation. It takes a different kind of leader to have this, to host this program and someone who's skilled at facilitating. So drawing out conversation uh, into the room. And so if you've got a great skilled facilitator, they can do that virtually as well. And so it impacts how you source people for training and leading this conversation and the ways that you ready folks uh, for leading a men as allies program is more about facilitation than training, right? It's not a read you know 10 pages of a script and then regurgitate that um, you can it's at, about asking questions about hosting dialogue and that can certainly be done um, virtually we just got to think right we do this on conference calls on zoom meetings on webex meetings on skype calls all day long and so what is it that you're doing to engage in a business as usual meeting that you can just pour it over uh, to how you are facilitating I'll go back, I kind of started the conversation and forgot. The breakout rooms are really important. And so, you know, facilitation and warning, you lob a big question out to the audience uh, virtually, and it's a big audience, uh, maybe it's 30 people. You probably won't get anyone to respond or the same person who always responds will respond and then no one else. A couple reasons for that. They're maybe multitasking. And so get those videos on. Uh, or um, they're thinking, well, okay, someone else is going to respond to that question. I don't have to, right? We're not going to reach for that mute button. The breakout room functionality that I know is offered at least in WebEx, but maybe in other platforms as well, takes that big group and makes it smaller and isolates them. And you can make that any size you want. Like, I'm going to put three of you in a room to have this conversation. And it's all kind of magical. And then you bring everybody back and you say, so what were your conversations like? Harder for folks to not participate when the group is smaller. So think about ways you might do that if you don't have um, that functionality in your own um, uh, platforms that you're using, you can just schedule individual meetings, right, and assign kind of a lead for that meeting and say, you're going to start with 15 minutes on different conference lines, and then I'll bring you all together, right? So at 1030, come back together onto the main line. So there's ways you can kind of architect that even without um, all the bells and whistles of some of the technology that allows for that. Um, anything else, uh, Kirsten, on just training logistics you can think of, of how to engage virtually? 
you know, it's interesting, but one of the ways I've also done this is, um, I, you know, you mentioned the pre-work. Um, I switch it up a little bit. Sometimes I'll send out a video um, mm -hmm. because some people are better with that. Um, I find that the, you know, the pre-homework of talking to people um, has been the most impactful, um, both in class sessions um, and before. And um, I've actually sent it out multiple times. So if people didn't do it the first time, I'm like, you know, if you didn't do it, but you liked the conversation we just had, I'm going to send it to you again. I'd love to use this to seed further conversations down the line. Um, I also, just as a best practice, usually leave myself a 30-minute buffer um, after any of these classes I'm teaching, whether that's in the classroom or that's virtual. Um, and I try to call out at the beginning if there's something that you um, don't feel comfortable talking about in the group or a question you really want to ask um, or you want further dialogue after, ping me. Um, I'll be here to have that conversation with you. And I find um, in person, it always happens. Um, and it happens pretty frequently virtually too, because there's often power dynamics, things at play. We try to be super intentional about the groups that we put together. Um, but there might be things where people are looking for someone to talk to um, afterwards or continue a thought that we just didn't have time for. Um, and I think it's really important for us as facilitators to leave that space. I love that. Office hours. Uh, that's not something that I've done before, but I'm taking a note. Best practice learned. Uh, thank you. Um, all right, last thing um, just for this slide is, you know, there's, we talked about employee networks and some adaptations you can make there. We talked about more specifically the training, um, but allies may be taking up mentorship and sponsorship um, activities as well. And that looks different virtually, certainly, um, but where there's um, a virtual relationship, it can provide opportunity too. And so what does virtual mentorship look like as a conversation you should be having? Um, there's like employee networks, uh, there can be a, a very much an upside to this. And so we talk about different types of bias in the program and one of the which, uh, one of the ones we address is distance bias. Uh, and so that the, that's the idea that the further away you are from someone in proximity or in time uh, or an event in time even, the more likely the bias is to pop in. So um, it may be easier to mentor and sponsor someone that's in the office, someone I know and see all the time and, and build a relationship with that person. Great, that's fine. But now we're all sitting at home. And so it opens the door to, wow, no one's sitting next to me anymore. This becomes more difficult, perhaps, um, just to, to have a, a, a hallway conversation that you might feel as mentorship. It has to be more intentional in how you uh, identify a mentor or a mentee, and then how you approach that conversation. So it can create brand new relationships um, that you may not have uh, thought about before. It may also be having you listen in more closely to your conference calls to see who's speaking. And um, I, I hear a voice pretty persistently on my phone call. I'm not sure I've ever interacted with that person, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, and maybe I should start that. Uh, and so it gives you access to a whole new view um, in terms of who is being mentored or who is being sponsored. Um, and so that uh, can be challenging. Uh, but then think back to, well, you have one-on-one -on -one conversations, I imagine, if you're a minute manager with an employee, uh, and you're probably doing that great. Or maybe you're not, and maybe there's just an opportunity to upskill in that overall kind of virtual one-on-one -on -one conversations. But the same principles apply to how you might approach that conversation virtually. It gives you access to a whole different point of view. The conversations may also be different. And um, I'll highlight this on the next slide, actually. I was thinking about um, different questions we can ask of allies during you know virtual times. And uh, there may be different things that come up for people when they're at home. Uh, managing uh, work-life balance is was hard before. Maybe it's harder now. Maybe it's maybe it's easier now. I don't know. Uh, different to a person in this environment gives us the chance to ask those questions in a new way or in a safer way. Uh, and so in my mentorship and sponsorship, doing that virtually, um, uh, it can really change the dynamic and the kinds of questions that we might ask or think to ask. I, you know, this is certainly not meant to be an exhaustive list, but if you have, uh, if you're engaging allies or you're wanting to engage allies, just starting a conversation, here's a bunch of things that I thought of that, you know, particularly um, relevant at this point. Um, and then certainly there are others, but we'll walk through a couple of them. First is asking the question to allies. So how do virtual environments increase or decrease inclusion? What have you noticed? 
Uh, and so I've had allies in our group reach out to us and talk about how they're newly observing how people are stepping on each other in conversation, uh, drawing out some new observations around inclusion relative to gender. And then, okay, well, that starts another dialogue. So how do you mitigate that? Um, so you've noticed it now, and what are you going to do about it? And then when we all come back to in-person, um, uh, how, how does that learning or that skill apply? Second is what new observations can you make about gender roles? Um, uh, as maybe uh, the ally is at home, working at home for the first time, um, kind of persistently, maybe not the first time, but every day, all day. And what new observations do you have about um, gender dynamics in your house or roles and responsibilities in your home? Um, and what kind of new conversations have you started at home that may also apply at work? And then how does that change the conversation when you're talking to your peers or your subordinates about the challenges that they're facing at home right now? Is there a gender dimension to that or isn't there? Um, and so it's a new conversation to be in. And if you're an ally, you're intentional about having that conversation. Uh, if you're new to working at home, what uh, new things do you notice about gender equity? So a different, really, a different way of saying that. Um, the fourth is, are there gender inequities in your organization in their return to work strategy? So a lot of folks are thinking, okay, so how, when we come out of this, what happens? Uh, we've made changes to our policies, changes to our procedures, time off looks a little bit different, work at home looks a little bit different. We're building up this new normal and then we'll have to shift into a new, new normal when things get back to normal, whatever that may be. And so uh, two questions that are related, what does that look like? Um, and when you apply a gender lens to that, what does that mean? Um, I'll give you maybe an example I was thinking of. Um, if your organization is gonna have folks come back or staged over time, um, is there some sort of bias in there that would suggest that one gender comes back earlier than another or, or not? Um, and who's on these teams that are working through this strategy? Is, are they gender inclusive teams? And what does that look like? And the last thing, again, there's probably many other questions to be asked uh, these days, but um, how is your organization talking about diversity and inclusion in general during this shift while you're at home or while you're coming back? Uh, because that's the foundation to lean on when you're thinking about a men as allies program. I think another thing to think about is how do you move a men as allies program through an organization that's going through lots of change where priorities have shifted pretty dramatically. And so is it the time to be saying, you know, what we should do during these crazy times is do a men as allies program, right? Well, that depends. Um, how is your organization talking about diversity and inclusion? Is it core to your talent strategy? Is it core to how you're getting business done? How do you build off of existing messages to talk about men as allies or as an extension of that? Or talk about how having allies will really help us through more challenging times or virtual times. Uh, and so uh, thinking about the core of diversity and inclusion and the messaging there. So a couple ideas, you can ask allies these things tomorrow or um, as part of a formal program if you're having discussions now. Um, curious, I know I didn't, we didn't prep you for this, but anything else you might ask? Well, I love these. I think this is great. Um, I think what's interesting is when we say returning to a normal, I'm actually hoping from a DEI perspective that we don't return to normal as mm -hmm. it was, right? <laughs> that this is actually giving us that opportunity to inspect work from home practices. Um, those folks that commute a long way, those folks with disabilities that have asked for this for years. Um, and so I do think that there is, to your point, a really deep lens that we can continue to use as we have some of these conversations. Um, and we just, start the conversation. I found um, our leaders are doing an excellent job of, of driving these and asking what's working for you, what's not. Um, and I find that, you know, just from a personal perspective, um, whether it's internal or external, um, you know, having these questions asked is kind of some of that first step. Um, people that are listening to the ability to, you know, us asking, um, are you okay? Do you have what you need? Do you need to work reduce hours? Something simple as that might actually give somebody the mental space to be able to say, I'm actually okay, but if I needed it, um, I can ask for it, right? And I think that's a good thing. So I love your list here. It's great. Yeah. And I'm going to jump in here, um, uh, Kirsten and, and Josh, because we started to have some questions come in um, while you're all speaking. And Actually, your last few points are a great place to jump off with our first question, which is, uh, can we apply these materials to more than gender or be more intentional about intersectionality? Um, Kirsten, Josh, we have certainly talked about this a lot. 
I can um, I can answer, or Josh, I could throw it to you if you if you want to answer it. Yeah, go for it, Amy. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly add on to what you share if you've left anything that maybe I can add to from a PNC experience. Yeah. Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, we did a whole revision um, to our toolkit and our curriculum earlier this year. And um, part of the toolkit is key concerns that organizations have in implementing a Men's Allies program. And one of them is just that. Why should I devote all of these resources to one underrepresented population in the workspace. Um, I think that uh, Kirsten and Josh could probably back me up here, but what we do in the Men as Allies program is really teach people to be more aware, to have a different perspective um, in working with underrepresented populations as a whole. Uh, yes, we are forte, and so we apply it in the gender space, but I think it is very applicable across all underrepresented populations, and we do say that um, in the toolkit. We have, um, we have updated the curriculum, as a matter of fact, to be much more intentional about intersectionality, and I want to thank Amazon, because I think Amazon, um, when they first got our, our older first version of the curriculum, they said, you know what, I think you need just a little bit more on intersectionality in here and we said, yes, we do. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. So, so I think the answer is yes, Josh, do you have anything you wanna add? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the framework that is provided really um, lends itself to applying it against many other diverse segments or just the general topic of intersectionality, um, but know that the needs, and we all know this, right? But the needs of every diverse group uh, are very different. And so how you apply the model or apply the framework and the actions you might take are very different. And the, and the uh, program asks for men, in this case, just be really introspective in evaluating your lens that you see this world through, looking at the research and understanding the segment, in this case, um, gender. And then through both of those lenses, now create action. Uh, because if I didn't do the first thing and the second thing and I just created action, well, I can Google that tomorrow. The things that I will do are not authentic um, and not sustainable. But when I do those first two steps, then it really becomes uh, much more uh, of both of those things. So absolutely agree. Great. Um, Kirsten, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add, but I do want to, before I turn it to you in case there is, I want to say that we have time for just a few more questions. If you want to type your questions, um, some of you have been typing them into the chat box. Some of you have been typing them into the Q&A box. Um, we see them either way. So feel free to, to type your questions right now. But Kirsten, was there anything you wanted to add? I was just thinking about it personally as I think about being an ally um, is that it's obviously, you know, it's a conversation of you don't walk away with a special badge and say, you know, I got it after nine sessions, right? And so as we think about this and we think about looking at privilege and listening to people's experiences that are different than our own and speaking up for people but not speaking over them um, and that we're really intentional about saying that mistakes are going to happen consistently and that I will probably make them. In fact, I do make them all the time um, and you will too. Uh, but you don't build that muscle unless you do that. Um, I think all those things to the point you made earlier apply in a number of different spaces, not just looking at it through the, the gender lens. Um, and we've been really intentional about saying that this is something that's open to all genders, not just, but that we do talk about, you know, frequently the male female binary, um, because that is what this program was built on. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer this first question because it's, 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 one of my favorite stories because it's how I met Kirsten. Um, but how did you reach out to get involved um, with Forte to start this programming at Amazon? Um, Kirsten was actually on a Forte mailing list because she had participated in a survey. And we wanted to beta test an early version of the corporate toolkit. And, um, and so we wrote to that list and said, you had expressed an interest in this topic. Um, do you want to know more? And Kirsten wrote back right away. Little did Kirsten know at that time, um, Amazon was already a 4K partner. So it just turned out to be um, great all the way around um, for our relationship with Amazon, uh, for, 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 for men as allies. But, so I just wanted to answer that program. But I'm going to ask this question to either Kirsten or Josh, which is, do you feel you need a, a male co-leader to get initial buy-in? on this program. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna extend it. That was the question that was written and I'm gonna extend it. Do you need do you need a male or do you also do you need a woman involved to get buy-in? 
Who's going to go first? <laughs> uh, um, I was like, who did she ask first? Um, <laughs> I think like the, the mute buttons come off. Um, yeah. uh, I think it's depend on your organization and how decisions are made in your organization. I think inclusion, more inclusive is always better. Uh, whether it's the buy-in, right, to get the, uh, the movement that you need, uh, or just generally thinking about how women are included in the program itself uh, through uh, bringing their experiences forward. Women must, must, must be involved. I think uh, organization to organization, you know, where you need sponsorship and how those levers are um, pooled can be very different, but more inclusion um, than less. What you don't want is to you know, sit in a room with a bunch of guys and come up with this big plan and put it out and be like, we're doing men as allies, right? It seems kind of strange. So. Um, more women's inclusion in all aspects, yes. I think it's a critical conversation between all genders, right? Like Josh and I are both in roles to bring um, programs to life, right? So I think that we have some some privilege there to be able to say this is something we should do and this is why, but that's based on experience and, and asks from, from the business. Um, and I personally think it's going to be critical going forward as we continue to expand that it's facilitated by both men and women um, because we both bring, um, you know, life experience to the table um, and can engage, I think, in different ways um, that might resonate with people, um, you know. Again, my experiences is mine, um, and Josh's are his, and Amy's yours are yours, um, and all of us could teach it, and somebody might get something very different from each of us. Yeah. Yeah, um, Josh, I am gonna address this question to you, which is how do you address the generational attitude about women that may exist? You know, um, what was even uh, fascinating to me as we put the materials together as I learned to teach it was some of the research specifically around generational attitudes around gender. Um, I think the assumption that most made, the participants made, uh, was that this is going to solve itself over time, right? The younger generation gets it, they're just generally more inclusive, um, but in fact the research would suggest that's not the case, right? There's a level of not discussing it or uh, maybe even some degree of complacency that changes the, the, um, how this comes to life or if action is taken. Uh, and so how do we address it? We, in this case, we address it specifically through research and kind of surprise people uh, and thinking about it because many of the, for, for us, it's mostly managers in the cohort. Um, and so many are managing younger uh, employees who uh, they have an assumption of like, well, I don't need to really cascade this message because they kind of get it. Um, they may get it from an inclusion perspective or expect that that's how inclusion works in our organization, but aren't doing anything about it. And so we address it specifically in the program through sharing some research and then discussion to go with it. Awesome. I'm going to jump to another question right now. And Kirsten, maybe I can throw this um, to you, which is how are people selected for this program? Is it volunteers or are people assigned? So I was going to say, I think it's going to be different for every organization, right? Um, there's got to be some intentionality around it. I saw in the chat too, there was a question about how do you bring people in who don't naturally consider themselves as allies, right? Um, and so I think initially starting this, um, it was very important for us to see this at a senior leadership level, right? So um, country leaders, site leaders, um, because what, what gets seen and emulated at the top gets done, right? Um, and so um, I know Josh, you as well, had kind of been very intentional about those initial cohorts. Um, long term, I would love to see this seeded through um, not only senior managers, but middle level managers as well, because there's a, a vast group of folks who um, really need to be exposed. And Amy, your materials are really great when it comes to the standpoint of, you know, there's people that just don't, don't see or they see it as a problem for themselves all the way to the folks that we're trying to create, which are those that see the issues and then can, can actually act on those intentionally. Um, and so um, we've been intentional initially about assigning folks to this, um, asking for volunteers, but then also asking people to be part of the conversation. Um, I think that will evolve over time. So again, large company, lots of changes, but uh, I, I think starting with those people that need to, to be able to be your allies in building um, continuous growth and development of the program itself is key. Amy, I see one clarification that came in on the generational question, um, and just a quick anecdote. 
uh, the question it will clarify on generation is how are we transporting this to a conversation around how children are managed and, and you know raising them through the lens of gender equity um, we certainly focus this conversation in the actions people take on the workplace but more often than not we're asking for the experiences outside of the workplace to come in to talk about your gender lens and then as they put actions together as allies right there they are then moving those from the workplace to home as well we get lots of in between stories that come back at the beginning of sessions to be like you'll never believe what my son said or my daughter said and how I address that and so I think the skills that we teach certainly um, can be uh, reapplied uh, back at home uh, one particular anecdote that was shared and there's no real right or wrong answer here but just the idea that awareness is raised is uh, one of the participants was playing in the creek. If you're from Western Pennsylvania, you know what the creek is. It's a small stream of water usually behind your house. Uh, and so there was playing in the creek with his um, son, oh no, it was his daughter, uh, and said uh, they were digging for salamanders and different things. And the daughter looks at his, uh, at the, the dad who was in the program and says, dad, mom said that I'm a tomboy, is that true? And whew, his feelers went right up because he was thinking through the lens of gender equity and how those kinds of messages reinforce things we want to reinforce or don't want to reinforce. And then he, she followed up with the question, is there such thing as a Tom girl? Uh, and so he went back and had this conversation with his wife about, you know, what that language means and how maybe to use it at home. And so these certain, certainly these things that we talk about um, have applicability, even just raising the conscious level of consciousness of what happens at home. A fun story. Yeah, but Josh, well, first of all, let me say that it's it, it's Crick if you're in northeastern Pennsylvania as well. Um, it's Creek for everybody else, um, in case you wondered what that word he was talking about was. Um, but you raised a really great point that I'd like to, to near our ending on, which is about the question. And a big part of allyship is being able to ask those types of questions, right? So the fact that this participant in your program was able to all of a sudden see that there might be something problematic, he didn't have an answer, but he was able to ask himself the question, bring it to others, start discussions around this topic. I think that sums up um, one, of the, one of the things we're trying to achieve with this program in general. For those of you that joined late, um, I saw some questions come in. We are discussing the Men as Allies program, um, Fortress Men as Allies program. You can find information on Men as Allies in general on Forte's website, fortefoundation.org. Go to programs and then go to Men as Allies. There's information there about our corporate toolkit, our MBA toolkit, as well as our corporate curriculum. Um, I'm just lucky enough that uh, Kirsten from Amazon and Josh from PNC have had the chance to not only uh, use the curriculum, test it out, but now start to try to adapt it into this virtual environment that we're all living in. Um, any last thoughts before uh, we conclude today's webinar? Uh, Kirsten, I'll start with you. Any last thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm just looking at the questions and there's been questions around um, how is this applied outside of North America? Um, you know, can I start this if I can't do the full program? And I would say yes and yes. Um, you know, take the materials, um, make them your own. Um, it might be something as a simple, you know, fireside chat where you ask a couple of these questions or touch on some of the, the concepts at large. Um, it might be engaging with teams um, in different areas of the world and saying, okay, this is the materials as they stand. What would make them applicable to you in your space with the cultural lens that you have? Um, so I'm thankful for it. I would say play with it. You don't have to use it right out of the box. Josh, ditto, ditto for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly talking to my team and it's, you know, a bit cliche probably at this point, so many weeks in, but uh, necessity truly is the mother of innovation uh, and really the mother of inclusion. Uh, and so thinking about, you know, how do you um, take the situation that you're in now and make it really work uh, to your advantage. Um, maybe now is exactly the right time, or maybe with just a few adaptations. So you, my message is you can do this. You can do it virtually. You can do it in person. Uh, and I know Amy and the team will look forward to kind of supporting you through that journey. 
Great. Well, once again, huge thank you to our audience uh, for your time and your attention, uh, to Kirsten from Amazon, to Josh from PNC. Um, a recording of this webinar and other Wool Plus Men Lead and Women Lead webinars are available on our website. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.